All right, as Casey was saying, I'm with the University of Nebraska. My expertise is primarily in greenhouses and high tunnels and season extension type activities. Uh, Casey asked me to come on board with them uh, because of, of uh, my background in this area. Um, the interesting thing about a lot of the season extension projects is a lot of times they're grower driven. There's a lot of products available out on the market. There's a lot of YouTube uh, videos available on how you can do various practices. Um, as Casey knows, all of you know, being from Nebraska, our weather is more unique than most places or many places in the nation. Uh, so it's very important to me as somebody that wants to support our industry in Nebraska, that when the grower has a product or a tool such as a tunnel, uh, that we um, provide the best information we can so that they'll be successful for it. Um, as Casey said, we had three growers in the previous fan, uh, grant funding cycle and then this current year we uh, have three more. What we did was we were trying to pick different places across the state because our state is huge. We have different types of soils, environmental conditions, um, and then we wanted to look at different types of projects. So the one at Elm Creek that we were just at, some of you were at, was a shade unit. Their primary purpose for that unit was crop production. Um, most of you guys are producing crops that would be sold at farmers markets or grocery stores, um, direct marketed. And we all know that the higher the quality of the product, then the more money we can actually drive from it. Uh, we have a very aesthetic product. Unlike canned, canned vegetables and all that, people are buying fresh goods. They don't want to see blemishes and spots and all that. So our goal is to offer up high quality products. As a farmer, Mark wants to have his income over a longer period of time. Because as you know, we go from winter to summer to spring, sometimes back to winter and back to summer, right? So. Uh, through the use of a variety of tools, hopefully the shade unit will protect us from high winds and hail, heavy rains which can damage the crop. Mark selected to use a high tunnel. Uh, the way they wrote their project was really uh, good because he does a lot of tomato production on another farm. You're still doing that. Um, so he has another farm down the road that he grows all his tomatoes outdoors, but his market was fairly narrow. Mm -hmm. So he was looking at this tunnel, offering him the opportunity to put crops in earlier in the season so he could, the sooner you get a tomato on the market, if you're at the market with the first tomato brings in the best dollar than the one that's there in September. So, um, however, Mark's going to have hopefully high quality, so he'll always get the strongest dollar. Uh, then the one up at Brunswick is another high tunnel, but what's unique about it is we're looking at berry production. So the problem they're having in Brunswick, which is clear up by South Dakota, is that winter hits, what, Casey, the end of September up there. We were up there and they had ice all over everything, and they were still in the middle of prime uh, harvest. So we're looking at a perennial crop, where this one's going to be an annual crop up there. We're looking at perennial crops. So that'll be in September 15th, or 14th, I think, is when that uh, project is. And then uh, next year, Western Nebraska will have a moving high tunnel. So there's one out, and it's not, it is supposed to move. You know, we're talking Sydney, Nebraska. So uh, they have high winds and volatile weather. So we want to look at something that's moving out there. So that'd be pretty fascinating. And then a large shade unit uh, near Lincoln, which will be kind of interesting. So I'm going to get on uh, talking about this structure specifically. You guys have asked a lot of great questions. Uh, I'm here specifically for you guys to pick my brain. I do have this information I provided. There's actually two different handouts that I redesigned for you guys uh, for today that I hope will help uh, that you can read later on more specifics. Um, the reason being, as I said initially, is there are a lot of suppliers out there that offer high tunnels. Farm Tech, Grower Supply, the company you were with was... Morgan County Morgan Seeds. Morgan County Seeds. If you go to the Great Plains Vegetable Growers Conference, they're down there. Steppies is there, Hummerts International. Mm -hmm. Everybody offers a high tunnel. Everybody wants to sell you a bill of goods. What you need to do as individual growers is you have to decide before you go buy high tunnels, what do I want to grow in it? And Mark had already decided initially, tomatoes, mm -hmm. right? And then he might want to grow some other things. But given he wanted tomatoes, you'll notice that this structure has some side walls. 
So he went with an elevated structure. The least expensive structure that you'll find through Grower Supplier Farm Tech is a ground-to-ground -ground structure. Now what I'm talking about today, you'll see it throughout this in, in various places. So um, if you forget something and wish you'd taken notes, most of what I'm talking about is here. But a ground-to-ground -ground structure is going to be one that's a half round, that's a bent pipe continuous. Those are the least expensive because they have the least amount of metals involved in them. Uh, they do tend to have a little bit more movement in them because they don't have as many metals. Uh, when you look at this structure, Mark really went almost Cadillac on this particular structure. You'll see a section in this, this guide that I've given you that talks about grades of metals. Whenever you look at catalogs, and I told Mark this early on, we want apples to apples comparison. So if you get a bid from one company and a bid from another, compare what the steel prices or the steel diameters are. You got a two and a quarter inch or two two and a half two and a half inch steel on here which is this massive now if you think about where he's at you can all see it up here you can imagine the winds can get pretty tough he's probably not going to have any trouble with this structure moving but there's a lot of structures out there with a 1.314 diameter steel really small and don't get caught in that loop sometimes you know price is going to bite you in the backside on it so uh, the other thing is, given he wanted to do tomatoes, uh, he'll talk about that here in a minute, but he has two different types of tomatoes. Some will be shorter, some will be taller. If he wants to have very tall tomatoes, he might have wanted a structure that's a little taller. The other thing he wants to look at is his production practice. How does he want to manage the soil on the inside? You'll notice he put some big doors in, so this gives him the opportunity to bring in, if he wanted to, a compact tractor with a real tiller, if he wanted to or he can use a regular rototiller. He could have smaller doors, but then he might limit his air movement. So by having these big doors, he's opened it up where he can get some equipment in if he wants to. He can also get some air movement through it. He did not want to have furnaces. He didn't want to have fans. He wanted the natural environment, but he wanted to be able to um, manage it, uh, somewhat manage it in order to like keep uh, the plants warmer early season. Uh, and also protect it from the high winds and hail. Okay. There's some key components of this structure that we'll look at here in just a few minutes, but some of the specifics are, uh, this is a steel structure. It's a large steel structure. They offer these in uh, bow spaces, and if you don't understand what I mean, you'll notice on the front page it gives descriptions, but the bows or the ribs or the, or the rib cage that you see down through there is what we call the bows. Those come in a variety of spacing. So not only do we have different metal diameters, but then we also have different spaces at which those can be offered. Initially, you were looking at a six foot spacing on it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then he changed to four foot spacings on it because he was a little concerned about how much movement he might have. Um, <clears throat> if we go with these smaller diameter metals, then four foot is the proper spacing. There's a only one company I can think of is Jader Loon out there that has a five foot spacing. Now they're more from South Carolina and the Carolina, Georgia area. Uh, but up here in Nebraska, typically the ones we'll see is either four foot spacings and six foot spacings. Many times cold or high tunnels will be sold with six foot spacings because they see them as a lower, uh, um, a lower um, requiring engineering spec type structure. But given his exposure up here, he went with the heavier metals. I want you to take a look on the inside when you go in there in a little bit. And you'll notice that there's some angle metals. This is critical of any structure, and I see it missing in many of them that's available, or growers won't put them in and they don't realize what they are, but that's wind bracing, and that's what's going to keep that structure from wanting to twist. So we talked about the bow diameter having a certain amount of strength, and that's to keep us up and down movement to a minimum, which can be a problem if we have heavy snowfall, wet snow. And we get that in our area. I'm south of Lincoln. We'll get wet snows. And on my greenhouse, which has a low profile, it wants to stick to the roof and won't slide off, and that can cause collapse. So Mark's steel structure is strong enough one, he has a fairly high pitch, which hopefully will slide off. If it doesn't slide off and stick, then hopefully the structure is beefy enough that it's not going to want to collapse. 
On the inside he has wind bracing and that's that 45 degree angle metal that you see throughout in various corners. And what's that going to do is going to prevent from that wind that he might have come from the southwest, smack the side of it and keep the structure from twisting. So those uh, wind braces are critical. You can get as few wind braces as one in each corner and you can get more that will go in from the wall so he could have one that would be right here in the middle and kick up in order to keep his wall from blowing in. Mark was conversing when I first got here about a big wind that came in from the south and blew your doors in. Uh, we don't know when these micro bursts are going to occur, so we want to make sure our structure can, can uh, handle that. Okay? A unique thing about Mark's structure that you see here is he's got a concrete foundation. Now it's kind of a mock foundation because it's only what, 8 inches, 12 inches deep? Yeah, for the most part, yeah. He put a perimeter concrete base. He had con concrete available. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you put what, a couple rebar in there mm -hmm. in order to keep the thing from wanting to uh, break and whatnot. With high tunnels, greenhouses that are not in pier construction, sometimes the structures will want to sink if they get weight on them and the soil is real wet or Another thing that can happen is if the winds keep coming in and popping the structure, it can create lift and pull the structure up. So what Mark has created is a big concrete boot. Now he has the ground posts in the ground, what, 36 inches maybe? Actually, actually I don't have any ground posts. Oh, you don't have any ground posts? No. So it's all hanging on the boot? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he doesn't really have any ground posts. He's got his on this concrete perimeter. Uh, the weight of that is going to keep it uh, basically a floating, is basically a floating floor, so that's hopefully going to remain continuous for you. Uh, with that, you'll notice he has a very good seal in the soil, so that's going to uh, prevent those rodents from wanting to come through there. All right. The other thing that's critical about the type of baseboard he has, he has a combination of the wood and the concrete, that's going to prevent that temperature from wanting to migrate through. Now many growers will just put a piece of wood that's laying down on the soil. Now our soils are high in minerals and if it's a sandy soil then you've got the granite that's in there and temperature will conduct through that soil. So even though you have a high tunnel in the winter, if Mark decides he wants to try growing something in January, February, cool crop, the problem he could have is if it's really cold outside that temperature can come on through the structure. So by him having this concrete, that's going to hopefully prevent that thermal conductance or the temperature movement from outside to inside. So he's reducing the conductance of the temperature and he's reducing the air infiltration by having that nice seal there. And then we talked about rodents. And then he's got the concrete boot that's going to prevent that structure from wanting to sink and move around. All right. Um, plastic, six mil polyethylene, greenhouse grade. No, you cannot buy the plastic at Menards or Lowe's. You have to get it through a greenhouse supplier. And it's pretty expensive. What, about $400 a roll for you? Um, $389? Yes, it was in the threes. I yeah, threes. $389 for a roll of that plastic. Uh, however, he could expect a minimum of three years probably out of it, but it's rated for five years. As long as he keeps the plastic on as tight as he can and not have as much flapping and abrasion on the structure and he can repel hail stones or wheat straw, believe it or not, wheat straw will just go right through this stuff, um, then it will last hopefully up to five years on there. So, But at least three years we can probably count on. So six mil plastic, greenhouse grade, UV protection, okay? They offer other plastics. There's anti-condensate and there's UV, uh, or excuse me, infrared heat sheets. Every time you add those additional components, so at a minimum you need 6 mil polyethylene UV stable. That's ultraviolet stable. You can buy one that's upgraded, kind of like you can go from the Chevy to maybe a Pontiac, or they don't make Pontiac Ford. anymore. What did they go to? <laughs> <laughs> we lost our Pontiac and our Oldsmobile, didn't we? So anyway, we can move up our grade by adding some of these additional resins, and the two additional ones that I would probably look at is the anti-condensate. That's one that's been custom designed to prevent from having water accumulation on the roof, which can end up with drip. 
Now that's usually used by the greenhouse industry because they're growing crops in the winter and we don't want that water dropping in there because it causes diseases. Mark will have to monitor whether his crops are going to have enough moisture loss and cause that moisture accumulation on the roof. He'll have to decide that and then he can decide whether he wants to use anti-condensate. Another one they have is an infrared heat sheet. And if you're into engineering whatsoever, you'll notice that plastic is one of the worst insulators you could possibly have. And what do we have on here? Plastic. Because of the long wave radiation, the heat that we capture in the soil during the day at night just goes right out to outer space during the night. What they have done is they've designed a polyethylene sheet that has a resin in it that prevents that long wave radiation from emitting out of the structure. So if you think you want to be a grower in January or February using a high tunnel with no supplemental heat, then you might want to consider upgrading your plastic there. But as we add those resins, then his $387 sheet all of a sudden becomes $460 or $500, okay? So it's just something that you as a grower's kind of have to determine. His sidewall is a drop-down curtain. Now, some of you guys have seen roll-up sides. You've been to previous talks. You've been to other growers, and you see the crank with the roll-up side. Well, Mark selected the drop-down curtain, and I'll let him explain that in a little bit. But the cool thing about it is not that he had to spend more money than a roll-up would have been, but he's going to have more capability of managing his temperature environment inside the structure uh, during that e early season. So if he decides he wants to grow something in mid-March, late March, or he's got a nice stand of crops in there on April 15th, and all of a sudden Nebraska pulls what it usually does and we get a 28 degree day, and he wants to bring a little bit of cool air in, if he had a roll-up wall, it would open up from the bottom. All of a sudden that cold air comes in and it goes right across the crop at the feet or the roots. And that'll suppress water uptake by the plant. So even though the plant's warm up here, it's going to lose the water, but all of a sudden it becomes droughty because the roots can't take the water in. So by Mark selecting the drop-down curtain, he can open up from the eave side, drop it down a little bit, and we can let the heat escape a little bit and a little cool air in, and it's going to homogenize a little better. Much more time-consuming for Mark to install. Um, but once he's got it, a little bit more money, but he's going to have a much better uh, ability to control that environment on the inside. I think I'll probably shut up at this point and I'll let Mark explain further. There's more information. There's a couple little guides in here. One of them is site planning, which I didn't touch on. I suppose I should briefly. Uh, just look at where he put it. He put it up on top of the hill. He wanted to have a soil that's well drained. He was not previously in production, so he had to prepare. Did you rip the soil beforehand? Yeah, yeah chiseled so it. he chiseled it beforehand. Uh, so I always prefer a site that's already in production, but if it's not in production, then you need to start preparing it before you build that structure. I put four high tunnel, six high tunnels on campus at UNL. We built the structures first, then we tried to prep the soil, and that was a pain, believe me. So um, that was one heads up. I. Mark can explain in a little bit, but I did tell him, you know, it's easier to prep this thing before you build the structure, so he'll tell us what he thought. You'll notice he positioned it north-south, and I know you're all hot, so, uh, but the reason we did that was this particular location, his uh, dominant wind comes from the south-southwest, except in the winter it comes from the northwest, is that mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. So we want to work with the wind. The last thing we want is a structure that's sitting there like a big sail, I'm going to catch it. You'll see the literature will talk often that in our location and further north, our structure should run east to west. But anybody in Nebraska knowing with a 75 mile hour wind coming out of the southwest, the last thing we want is this big structure there that's going to catch and bend and push over. Um, so we want to work with the wind. So he's got it kind of t fit into the tailwind. The goal is on it sun comes up in the east, comes over, and we can get fairly even light, because you'll notice his rows inside are north to south, and that way we can get sun all the way around the uh, entire side of the plant. Soil prep, I think we've talked about. We want well-drained soils. <clears throat> if you're in a low location, um, we'll want to make sure that either the soil is elevated or we have improved the drainage somewhere because we don't want the, the roots to have wet feet, as we say. 
because if the roots stay too wet, then it opens up to disease and infection. Remember that root growth is going to be a fine balance of uh, fertility, available oxygen, and available water. And we need a good balance of those three. If we have a very dense soil like where I live, it's high in clay and it can get wet and won't dry out or it'll shrink so much I can't get water into it. So uh, his soil tends to look like more s there sand in this. It's probably a Hastings hasting silt mold. Yeah, it's got a silt in it. So his is uh, definitely different than mine. So, Does anybody have any questions of me before I turn it over to Mark? And then after Mark's done, uh, I'll hang around and you can ask me specific questions on it. So anybody have any questions about what I've talked about? All right. Is so, everybody signed the sign-in sheet, by the way? Anybody that has not signed it. So, um, do you want to, Mark, do you want to, do you feel comfortable just sure. telling him about everything you're doing? I don't have a problem. Okay, yeah. great. He's going to film you, so. Ben, if you want to, uh, or Mariah, if you want to, if they need some place to sit, go ahead and get a bale down for them to sit on. <laughs> we ran out of chairs, but. Did you guys like it, Ben? I have been do sitting it. all day at a conference. <laughs> Ramona, <laughs> we're fine. Ramona, do you want a bale? Would you like a bale sit to sit on? Where are you going to put it? Stand right up. over there if you want. Oh. Would you like a chair? I don't know. I don't care. Have a seat. Well, you I'll guys take a bale. Seat. Oh, no, 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 no. I've been sitting all day long. <laughs> you don't want a bale? <laughs> we're fine. Okay. okay uh, Stacy did a nice job of explaining the, the components of the structure and, and, and how it was put together and, and the reason it was designed that way. Um, I, like he said, uh, north-south was, was, the, was the direction I, I chose more so for, for the crop production inside. Uh, just, just for the fact that you know, the way the sun travels you get you get more photosynthesis in a plant coming from two sides that way as, as opposed to east and west you've always got the bottom edge of the row shaded to the north uh, if you go east and west which I, I'm not saying that it won't work it just uh, uh, provides for better growing conditions for the plants uh, in my opinion and, and obviously a lot of other people as well um, as far as the structure, uh, I did elect to, to put the cement foundation. I, I felt that uh, uh, it was a lot easier to set that hip board or the baseboard rather on that concrete rather than rather than on the soil because it's it's just you know with the type of wood that we've you know that you can get the lumber yard you don't see much straight stuff anymore and uh, I was able to. Uh, with the anchor bolts and the, and the use of like the loader tractor, I could I could take the warp out of a board real easy. You know, uh, being able to press down on the concrete. Uh, but uh, that's that's the reason we went north and south. Uh, as as far as the the hip board on the top, uh, we went a little heavier. We went with a two by eight up there. Uh, provides a little more stabilization for the sidewall curtain. Provides a little more closure space when you crank that side curtain up. Uh, I don't know if, if he explained all the you know all the components of it, but it'll this side curtain will come clear up here to the pulleys that I've got mounted on the side, and uh, that'll still give you about two inches of that two by eight to seal that seal that wind. And, and weather in or out, however, however you see fit there. So, um, as far as uh, the, the cement also allowed me, when I was driving the posts, uh, to get some solid uh, foundation or, or solid, something solid to fix it to because when they, uh, Morgan County Seeds is where I got the structure. Uh, they made it a. They made it like a. I guess it'd be a four-piece section. You've got the two side posts. You've got uh, one bow that gets you to the top. You've, then you've got the crown, 
you got the bow on the other side. So actually, actually I guess it'd be five pieces. Uh, so, and and they said it was a lot easier to ship, you know, uh, that way. Uh, I did go down and pick mine up as far as that part goes, but. Uh, what, what Mark is talking about is the bow. When you look at it, his is made up of five pieces. Shipping is a problem of greenhouses and high tunnels. So in order to get them in a semi truck and to pack them up, their lengths are limited. So um, what they did was they fluted the, the tube so that they could slide it together. So Mark had to find a flat spot to put those together. That's the only problem with bows that have to be pieced together is if he gets a slight twist in it and then he goes tipping that structure up then then it uh, makes it more difficult to get everything lined up absolutely so yep. um, yeah so this particular design has on that um, before I forget uh, since you brought up this roll up the other thing I want you to take a look at many growers will not put the skirt on the outside right here and that prevents air infiltration. Our ultimate goal is during early season is to prevent cold air from sliding in. But the other thing important uh, that's vital for us in our region is the high winds. We don't want to get that wind catching in there which can cause problem in there too. So uh, so I'll shut up. <laughs> oh, that's fine, that's fine. I'm glad you helped me explain okay. it. So, uh, as, as far as, you know, piecing the, the the bows together and everything. Uh, I hope you like putting in screws, you know, I mean, because you use oh a, a boatload of screws, let me tell you. you. It's, and and the self-tapping screw is a, a nice innovation. I mean, it, it'll, it'll drill its way, it'll drill itself through there, you know, but. Uh, Mark brings up the self-tapping screw and your supplier, did they supply them or mm -hmm. not? Okay. So his supplier probably found him a good self-tapping screw, but if for some reason you decide you want to design your own high tunnel, that's fine. But there are some inexpensive self-tapping screws out there, and from my personal experience, they're a real pain because the teeth on the or the tooth on the very bottom, if it snaps, you're just wasting your time because they won't cut. So it's worth spending just a teeny bit more money and getting a good quality self-tapping screw. Mm -hmm. Because Mark said it takes a lot. And, and I'll give you advice, don't, if in question on whether you have enough screws in wherever you're putting it, put another one in. Don't ever err on the, the opposite side because uh, you probably can't have too many screws with self-tapping screws. <laughs> right, right. And, and like putting on the, putting on the U channel or C channel like Stacy called it there. Um, I mean that's the only thing holding the plastic on the roof is that C channel and the wiggle wire. That's the only thing holding it on there. So it, I, I mean if, I, th I think I went I went about 12 inches you know a lot of places I went down to 8 or even 6 inches you know wherever I thought there might be a stress point. But. Uh, so Mark brings up an excellent point because your plastic is what 36 feet by 100 feet on this thing. Yeah. One piece of plastic and the only thing holding it is around the perimeter. So this is one place that sometimes growers will want to cheat on screws. And like he said, I think it's usually eight, eight to ten inches as usual standard practice, no further than 12 inches. Uh, I know. The grower up at Brunswick, when I got up there and saw hers initially, she had them at 24 inches on center. And I said, you really need to get in there and get more screws. Because those screws and that metal channel is all, as Mark said, holding that plastic on. And especially as when it gets cold and the plastic shrinks, we're talking two, three inches of shrinkage, and that starts pulling on that even harder. So he could even pull this out if there's not enough screws. So, you know, uh, that's that's kind of, you know, uh, the, the structure that it is. Uh, I could talk about the particulars of the, you know, putting the, you know, uh, I, I guess they're called, they're, they're like horseshoes, putting the posts on, uh, connecting the, the, the bow to the posts and all that. But uh, uh, that, that's, I guess that's part of construction too. And, and the instruction manual I had was, was, left a lot to be desired. I mean, I, I spent a, a time, I'll bet I spent a month just sitting there reading and rereading and rereading, you know, but uh, 
Uh, anyway, it, it got done and, and uh, uh, it turned out all right. Uh, like Stacy said earlier, I did have the south doors. They they blew in in the south wind, so I I had to come back in. Oh, that was probably first of June, end of May. And I had to put some more uh, beef up my head headboard on the top on each end. Uh, the wind blew on the south door, and it actually broke my two before frame. You know, double two before frame. It just broke it right out. But uh, I had to reinforce it, and, and it, it, it's working now. So I I want to highlight one thing Mark has said, and I've talked to other growers where they've had a very similar situation. But I've told you there's many suppliers of high tunnels. Some of them are more reputable than others. Some of them have more. Um, they put more effort into the product that they're putting forward. And I can't, I'm not going to say one company is better than the other because not all companies have the same sizes available. So there's gonna be a variety of reasons why you select your tunnel from a different supplier. I do know a couple companies have very well designed instruction manuals. I'm kind of a gearhead, so a lot of times I put something together and then go read and see what I did wrong. So some of you are like that. I think Mark has a blend of that, but this was out of his box thinking, I think, just a tad. Uh, the instructions he was given, I looked at, and I was a little bewildered by some of the information. It was like they were writing the manual for somebody to actually write, but they never got beyond what they hand wrote, and that kind of bothered me. So, um, yeah, so you'll have to use your resources, and the best resource is somebody that's done it. And that's why we're here today with Mark. He's done it. He can kind of tell you some stuff. You have some growers you know down the road, right? Mm -hmm. So he went and visited them a few times, and they were very... That's the neat thing about agricultural people is a lot of times, generally, they'll communicate with each other. Uh, I have a lot of experience just because I was in the construction background, and then I was in greenhouses for many years, so I've done some of this on my own. But each company is going to be a little bit different on how they go together, but the same concept applies from, from one to the other. So, uh, so, yeah, find out how much support you're going to get from the company. Some of the companies will have everything pre-cut, pre-identified, pre-packaged with numbers and letters, and when you read it, it'll say, well, part A it is affixed by this part, and give a description. And some of them... Poor Mark, he ended up with a box of screws. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a box of screws and bolts is like, okay, sort of. <laughs> and then it's like you're standing like, uh, do I use this screw or this screw? So it's no different than Christmas. You remember those <laughs> days? <laughs> <laughs> but, but we worked with a group. They screwed up a lot of our stuff. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if he's even going to say that, but you have to be careful. We thought we had everything ordered and yeah. it wasn't right. Well, and I'll have to tell you, even the most reputable company I put together, and I'm going to throw the name out, wonderful company, it's Polytex. Some of you may have heard of them. They've been in the industry a long time. Uh, I ordered a high tunnel and I put up for a grower, and everything was going swell until we went to put on, uh, there's a roll form, you don't have any roll form. Uh, there's explanation what roll forming is, but if anybody's heard of Unistrut or even steel studs, that's a roll form metal, and it takes a like a bracket that slides in there. It's got what we call two ears that slide in. So this Polytech company I was working with, I've had great luck with for it, and all of a sudden I go putting these uh, purlins on, and all of a sudden I realized they only gave me one of those clamps, and I actually needed one per each location, and they just when they boxed it, they forgot. So. You do need customer support, and it doesn't matter how good the company is or whatever, but you need to develop a working relationship with them because they shouldn't ever be missing something, but it happens. So, Well, they, the company Morgan County in, in Missouri is, is where I, Morgan County Seeds is where I got this. Uh, they were good with me. They got me all the parts I needed eventually, you know, but... Uh, like like he said, I went from six foot spacing to four foot spacing on the on the bows, and 
uh, when I picked it up, I thought, you know, uh, I thought I had it all. You know, I went down through the checklist, thought I had it all. Started driving posts, and I get about three fourths of the way down there, and I'm out of posts. You know, so they sent they sent it up to me. I didn't have to pay any shipping. You know, uh, which was, was nice of them. You know, uh, but they should have caught it the first time. So, but uh, yeah, work with somebody you know, you trust, I guess, and. Uh, you know, uh, and, and, and part of that is word of mouth. I mean, uh, Stacy here is, is yeah. know, knows a lot of companies, and, and, and he, he would give you a good referral to, do, to a good company. So, uh, uh, do a little uh, homework, I guess, first before you uh, go and order one. So. Cost, costs are going to be really wild, so. Um, and I think I cautioned Mark and I cautioned to another woman, just make sure that you get a list of materials. I know uh, Farm Tech, who we're working with for another project, they just have lumped everything together is what they call their 24 by 96 high tunnel. And it just says one 24 by 96 high tunnel, and that's the price. Well, that doesn't tell us anything. What you want is an itemized list. You want one that says 18, Two inch, 17 galvanized tubular steel bows, 28 such and such clamps, blah, blah. So that when you sit down and you have your three or four bids, you can look at it and say, oh my gosh, they're only using 1.6 diameter metal at six foot, and this company specs two inch. Same spacing. So right there all of a sudden it's like, eh, which do I think I need? Well, I'm in a real protected spot, so I can probably get by with the less metal. So we can go with the lower bid. Or, you know, it's like it's only going to take one win and we're going to lose the structure. And like Mark was concerned, I don't know, you decided to go to four foot spacings after the fact just because I think you were concerned about the how exposed he is up here. It's exposed, a beautiful spot, but it's uh, exposed. So. One thing I didn't mention too, as far as building the end walls, um, you want to be real careful on, on, on the type of wood that you use uh, as far as treated lumber. Uh, some of it can be corrosive to plastic, and you want to be real careful. So, you know, if, if you have access to cedar or something like that, uh, cedar is a good option. You know, Did you end up using treated lumber? I used treated lumber, but it was, it was uh, I want to say, copper? Oh my gosh. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'd have to look for sure. In general, anytime you put polyethylene against treated lumber of any type, it's going to void the warranty on the plastic. Oh, sure. I ran into this at the university when I managed the greenhouses there. We had one, uh, well, we had two hoop house style houses that had treated lumber baseboards and to prevent that we would slide in stru uh, structural styrofoam in between and then that would protect it from the, the, the chemical reaction that occurs between the plastic and the treated lumber. Uh, I know they're doing some work at the university right now and they do sell an adhesive back material that you can actually apply to the face of the wood as a barrier. Some of the high tunnels I put in we just used regular old raw plain wood. It's up in the air. It's going to dry out, so uh, it's very rare that it's ever going to rot. Some of them have gone on and painted it. As Mark said, you can use the redwood, you can use cedar, but then all of a sudden the price is tripled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you'll just have to decide what you can deal with. Mark really put a lot of framing in here. I've seen it as few as like six foot by six foot. So um, he's really set this up to give himself uh, his return of investment will take a little longer, but he's going to have much more return on his investment than what somebody would with a weaker structure. So, <coughs> long haul. <laughs> Anything else about the structure? Oh, I guess, you know, as far as the concrete foundation, I did set anchor bolts, and uh, I haven't done it yet uh, just to help hold it down. I've, I'm going to make some homemade L iron brackets out of you know inch steel and and you know quarter inch thicker or even thicker and 
L irons to put all the way around the outside and then run a bolt through the through the baseboard uh, to help hold it down even better. But uh, just haven't got that far yet. So, uh, any questions on the on the structure itself? Yes. I build his own tunnel, he welded, and he got all the metal he made it himself. He put them on a railroad car, or tell them what he did. No, mine's on a, I use railroad tires instead uh -huh. of concrete. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but mine is, is a pretty protected area. Yeah. And yeah. then we can move it to tell them what to yeah, do. One of them that I have is his movement to cover it. So and it's 18 foot wide and 75 foot long. And I moved that every By himself, by himself. I could not believe how easy it was. I would imagine if you're going to. If you're going to move something, boy, you better have the bracing in the corners. You know, I mean, you, you better have it stout, you know, if you're going to pull it around. The, the movable high tunnel is very fascinating. It works well. He's down in Wymore, which is down in a little different environment. Then next year we'll be at, out at Sydney. I don't know if we'll be able to get you guys out to Sydney, but we'll try and YouTube that one for you. And uh, that one is going to be on rails. Because of the concern, if you've been to Sydney, a beautiful area, nonstop wind, and the concern of that structure was it flying away. So uh, that one's on rails, so we'll see how that one. They've actually are going to build two, I hope. One's on metal rails, the other one's a wood rail system, so we can see two different approaches. Yeah. Um, ultimate purpose is they can move it down the rails, they can move. Uh, their soil beds yes. to prevent disease problems, but then they also can mature their crops and then just keep using that tool through there. Uh, or they can backtrack it if they need to to protect a crop that might be fruiting and they don't want to get damaged. So That's pretty cool. We'll see how it goes. That, yeah. Casey and I were really thrilled with it and we've been out there once and we'll probably go out there this fall. They're supposed to be building it now and the next year we'll have the farm tour. So we're excited. I think it's great given the environment we <laughs> How would the end walls work on a deal like that? A lot of them flip up. Okay. Here, flip up. So they're hinged and they flip up and they snap them here and then they can move the across. So. Or some of them have removable ends. Mm -hmm. What's the length and width? Uh, yeah, this is 30 a, by about 60. This is a, yeah, 30, mm -hmm. 30 mm -hmm. by 96. By 96, okay. Yeah. That brings up a good point. Um, Somebody came to me with a proposal for a high tunnel that was 60 foot long, and that made no sense to me whatsoever, unless you were ordering your plastic custom sized. But standard rolls will come in 100 foot or 150 foot rolls. So if you're going to build a house, you'll want to build like a 48 footer, because you can use half a roll. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes, I do. Or a 96. So he had a couple feet on either side for his imperfections that he may not realize he might have. <laughs> it's called wiggle room. Wiggle room, yeah. So he has some wiggle room there. Uh, or you can go to 150 feet, uh, which that structure would actually be 144 feet is what the real length is, and the plastic's at 150. Keep in mind, though, that plastic's not very light. Yours probably weighed about 130 pounds for your plastic. Roll, yeah. A roll of plastic, 130 pounds, may not sound like a whole lot until you, depending on how you do it, pulling it, mm -hmm. it gets kind of heavy. So um, I've lifted the big plastic up before. I actually made a jig that went on the front of my loader tractor. I have a compact tractor at home with a loader. It looked like a big toilet bowl, uh, toilet um, paper dispenser. Mm -hmm. And I made it out of a flagpole. It took, remember the Hallam tornado? It took our we lived just about just off that line, took our flagpole down, so I hated to throw my flagpole away. So I made a little wood jig that went on the bucket of my tractor, and I could put the plastic right on it, and then I would just lift it up, and then I would just crawl down the ridge, pull the plastic down, mm -hmm. and then just drop it down. So there's just little tricks that we all learn how to do. Yeah, that's, I kind of, I kind of, I guess you'd call it cheating or whatever you want to do. I had. I had, a friend, I had a friend come out with a with a sky track and he had a he had a, a scaffolding that he just drove into with his forks and lifted us up on the scaffolding 
and we set the roll right on the right on the frame of the scaffolding, and, and I just crawled right down the middle of the middle of the high tunnel, you know, and just pulled it four feet at a time, you know, and crawled over a bow, and then we just flipped it down, and and uh, uh, yeah, I'm glad it was a calm day. Yes. Uh, in between yeah. windstorms. Or whatever. Yeah, I mean, we we had just one little <laughs> puff of wind, and and the whole thing just kind of. Uh, lift it up and you're going, oh, come back here, please, <laughs> you know, but, uh, yeah. You know, that's where your extra spacing, narrower spacing comes into play. The way you crawled around there the other day, he, he would just step from one to the other because he could reach that four yes. foot. Yeah. And there was nothing that give. I mean, he, I, do, I thought it was just looking like a wreck to happen. Um, this particular structure is a little bit unique because he has that little crossbow in his rafter, which you don't see that on most structures. So his is a little beefier yet, which is giving it some more rigidity. But it made it even easier for Mark. He could probably climb through those rungs. He has four foot space. It's easier for him to go from one bow to the next. My structure that I have personally is six foot spacings and it's much more precarious and definitely not something that uh, the work uh, environment would like you see you doing, but sometimes growers or monkeys. We had our OSHA helmets on and everything. Yeah, I'm sure you, know. you did. And lots of helpers. Yes. Father-in-law, uh, mother-in-law, one kid. Unfortunately, yeah, you want to try and be as safe as possible, and if you're not comfortable doing something a certain way, then you need to do it a different way. There's, there's ways to lay the plastic on the floor and use ropes and pull it over and stuff like that, but that takes 10 to 12 people to pull it over. I always like the gusseted plastic the way it is, like Mark did, he rolled it down the top and then it just kind of drops over. Mm -hmm. it takes you two hours and all of a sudden it's yep. half down. I mean, yep. it's quick. Yep. So, but you got to, Mark's got to, you know, like, okay, what's it going to do for the next two hours and can we do this? So. Yep. <laughs> exactly. So any 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 questions on the on the structure itself? I mean that's that's what that's what you came to see basically. So you probably said it the plastic thickness, Bill. Six. Six. Mm -hmm. um, before we started, there was a question about that very thing, and, and some most growers use one layer of plastic on a, on a high tunnel. Some will use two layers. The thing you need to remember about plastic is it's not purely clear, it's actually shading. So it's probably only 84 to 86 percent clarity. So when that sun comes through there, and we're talking maybe March or April, the sun intensity will be reduced by that 14, 16 percent, okay? If we have two layers, then all of a sudden it's reduced another 14 to 16 percent. So um, the benefit of having two layers is we can get that tension in there to keep that plastic from moving, but then all of a sudden our light levels start decreasing. Cool season crops don't need near as much sun as something like his tomatoes, which can take as much sun as they can possibly get. So. I think whenever you're comfortable, if any, you can look around and Mark and I are around and you can ask any specifics uh, unless you have more questions. Any questions about the structure? I mean, if you want me to touch on what I've got growing in there or something, you're sure welcome to ask, you know. Um. Some of the high tunnels, <clears throat> I will bring up one point. If we talked about early on the ground-to-ground -ground half round structure, they do have roll-ups for those, and I have one of those on campus at UNL, and it causes me some problems. Because the roll up, we put eight foot up, so since it's coming up, it rolls up to about here. But our crops will still be out here, and when we get heavy rains, that rainwater will come down and crash right on our crop. Mm -hmm. So if we're not around when that rain comes, then the roof or the wall gets left up. We need to make sure we pull that wall down. The nice thing about Mark's structure is you'll notice his wall is straight up and down. So when the rain comes, it just goes shooting off and hopefully doesn't ruin his cantaloupe. But <laughs> anyway, it'll just come on down and it won't wreck his crops on the inside. So that's kind of something to think about. The other thing is, is Mark does have some tomatoes over here that are indeterminate. I've been in some green, uh, cold or er, high tunnels that have six foot, seven foot high tomatoes. They're very hot. That's because that air can't get through there. So if you think you're going to use an indeterminate tomato, then we want to get higher walls 
or Mark has these nice big doors he can open and get the air through that crop to cool it down. Remember if that crop gets hot, gets too hot, those flowers won't pollinate. So we want to make sure we can get that air temperature down. So Mark is trying some determinants so they're shorter and that probably works really well with this side wall here. So that's something to also think about is can we get the air movement through there we want uh, to prevent that heat delay on our flowers.